It is exciting to be here. My pulse is quickened. I am uh, full of anticipation and expectation of what Jesus can do. How many would like a revival in your life? Now, you might already be close to the Lord, but how many believe we can get a little bit closer? And I believe the Lord is ready and willing to do some extraordinary things in our life if we are receptive to the faintest whisper of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit sometimes is like the gentle breeze among the fallen leaves. How many want to catch that whisper of the Holy Spirit during this time? I believe that there is healing in this house. I believe that Jesus has set this up for his touch, his peculiar special touch in our life. And I want to tell you, I believe with all of my heart that those who seek him in secret, he will reward them openly. And I believe if you're seeking him, he's going to show up and do something singular and special here tonight. How many believe that Jesus is here and he wants us to be closer to him than ever before? Because... If I was to ask you the question, have you ever loved the Lord more than you do tonight? Have you ever been closer to the Lord more than you are tonight? The Bible says repent and do the first works to get your first love back. I am so happy tonight to declare a thing to you, that you can get your first love back. Amen? Look to your neighbor and tell them you can get your first love back. Would you do that? Look to your neighbor and say you can get your first love back. And if you're married, that's applied in more ways than one. All right. Well, I like to begin each presentation, each Bible study with prayer. So let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, I pray for the outpouring. We pray. We unite our faith and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because, Lord, only you know how to go in and change hearts. You promised to give us a new heart in Ezekiel 36, 26. You said in Ezekiel 11, verse 19, that you would give us one heart, a united heart for you. I claim the promise in Isaiah 43, 19. Dear God, you said, forget the former things. Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. Won't you do that new thing now? In Jesus' name. We believe you are and will in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I would like you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Mark, an easy book for me to remember the name of. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I've entitled this evening's message, Jesus Wants to be Wanted. And during this revival series, we're calling the revival series, This Is Your Time. I believe that we must not look into the distant future hoping that one day we will have revival. I believe that time is now in this place. And if not you, who? And if not now, where? Can you say amen? And so I believe the Lord is going to do something. As we open His Word, there is power in the Word. Amen? Mark chapter 6. We're looking there. Mark chapter 6. And we're going to begin there at verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. What did he have to pray about? On this eventful, dramatic day, Jesus had fed the multitude of of uh, four or 5,000 people besides, uh, besides women and children. This is before birth control, mind you. So there was probably an assembly of 20,000 people amidst that teeming uh, multitude, that mass of people that gathered together. Jesus just finished pulling off one of his most incredible, uh, noteworthy miracles. And so the, the climate was they wanted to, him to assert his power, to proclaim himself as king, and they knew he was a modest man, he was a humble man, so they felt, the disciples felt that they need to orchestrate this, that they need to kind of help him fan into flame this, uh, the, this political uh, Messiah uh, stance, and because they knew Jesus wouldn't push himself to the forefront, he needed a little help to get started. 
And so the disciples thought, let's jumpstart it. And so they talked about crowning him as king. But they were thinking of a political king. They thought, with all that power, uh, we want his hand. But Jesus wanted them to want his heart. You see, we all want to see his hand, but Jesus wants us first to get to his heart. Because if you find his heart, you will see his hand. And so they were all excited, caught, in, caught up in this uh, euphoria, and uh, Jesus, Jesus didn't respond as they would have liked. It didn't go as planned. And saddened and discouraged, Jesus told them, go get in the boat. I'll meet you on the other side. They had their orders, and they obeyed. But let me tell you something. They were bitterly disappointed. Their hopes were dashed. And so, as they were in that boat, as they were in that boat, they started questioning. Something's wrong here. Something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't look right. Uh, if, if, you know, I know Jesus. He's such a loving person, and he works miracles, but come on now. He is not recognizing his golden opportunities. He's missing it by, maybe he's not the Messiah. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. You know what, I was, and so the church choir was now having misgivings about their leader. And they were lamenting, and they were rehearsing the events of the day and how he let them down. And as they began to wonder, what the future held, and if they really wanted. Everybody say wanted. I can't hear you. Wanted. As they begin to wonder if they still wanted Jesus, all of a sudden, a storm came out of nowhere, and it threatened their life. Their life was on the line. Notice how the Bible describes this. The Bible uh, describes this in a very dramatic fashion. Let's go to it here in Mark chapter 6. And we're looking there at verse number 47. Now, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. Now, I've been on the Sea of Galilee. I haven't been on the middle of the sea. Neither have I been in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in a commotion like this. And he was alone on the land. Uh, the emphasis here is Jesus was not with them. But he did see them. Can you say amen? Amen. Then he saw them. Now, this is interesting. The Bible says he wasn't with them, but he saw them. And so I'm so thankful wherever we are, he sees us. And so the Bible says here, the Bible says here, it says they were in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them. What did he see? He saw them straining at rowing. You see, now they had something to preoccupy their minds instead of misgivings about Jesus being the Messiah. You see, be careful. When you start to complain, you might get something to complain about. Remember the children of Israel, when they begin to murmur and complain, it's recorded and chronicled faithfully in Numbers chapter 21. You remember when the Israelites started complaining, all of a sudden snakes came out of nowhere, came out of everywhere, every crevice. Now, I know in Oklahoma you have snakes, and down in Texas, not far away, we got some snakes as well. But you know what? Can you imagine if all of a sudden they just started coming out from every, every hiding place? That's what happened. You see, sometimes the Lord, when we begin to have doubts and we begin to speak unbelief and we begin to be faithless, sometimes the Lord allows the winds to blow and the waves to rise so that we will want Jesus once again. And more than ever. And so I want you to notice here, then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. The wind was what? It was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he, Jesus, came to them. Would you agree God has his timing for everything? You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, it says, God has a time for everything. And brothers and sisters, don't miss this point, my friend. This was their time. This was their time to get their fervor back for Jesus. This was their time to have a comeback. This was their time, as it were, to have a faith revival. You see, their faith was at an all-time ebb low, 
But when the storm came, let me tell you something, their stormy thoughts had to now focus on the storm. And I want you to notice here, the Bible says here, it says the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he, Jesus, came to them walking on the sea. Now can you imagine that? Jesus is walking on the stormy waves. And let me tell you something. They thought it was a ghost. They thought, they immediately equated this lone, strange phenomenon, this figure, this hazy figure and the lightning flashing and they still couldn't make out who it was. But all they knew is this figure, this lone man was approaching them, moving, and they thought this is an omen of certain death. You see, because they had been battling that tempest, they had been they had, they had been slammed against, thrown against each other, and the waves were smashing against the boat and the water spilling over into the boat. Their life was on the line. This was curtains for them as far as they felt. <clears throat> a matter of fact, listen to what it says in the book, Desire of Ages, a book I heartily recommend you read on the life of Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 381. Then the weary men gave themselves up for lost. In storm and darkness, the sea had taught them their own helplessness. And they longed, can I insert, wanted, they longed and wanted the presence for the presence of their master. And so they were battling the great tempest, and Jesus' eye was upon the storm-tossed boat. And Jesus knew just the time, not a little earlier, not a little later, he knew just the time to come to them. He knew when they would want him, when they would what? When they would want him the most. You know, the Lord allows us to go through storms. Lord, where are you? Don't worry, he'll show up just when you want him the most. Now, I'm not saying he's not with you. I'm just saying if you want to really see his hand, it'll come when you want him the most and you're trusting his heart. Listen to this, Desire of Ages 381. At the moment when they believe themselves lost, a gleam of light reveals a mysterious figure approaching them upon the water. So, once again, their eyes, I'm telling you, their eyes are fixed upon this strange appearance of a man walking the white-capped billows of the foaming sea. What a strange spectacle. And page 381, uh, but, but let's go back to Mark chapter 6. Let me read this, and then I'll go back to Desire of Ages for a moment. Notice here, it says, In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, Walking on the sea, and I have this underlined in my Bible, this portion would have passed them by. Now, did you catch the ring of that? Did you catch the implications of that? I mean, hit the pause button. This leaps from the page. This, this has my attention riveted. Think about it. Jesus appears, but they think it's a ghost, approaching them, and then... No, it's passing them by. It's passing them by. My question, didn't they need Jesus now more than ever? Question, why is he passing them by? Why is he walking by as if totally indifferent to them? Now, mind you, they still didn't see it was Jesus. Why was Jesus walking past them? Why was Jesus appearing to keep on going? Because Jesus will not impose his presence upon anyone. You have to want him. And God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit will allow the storms of life to beat against you, things to go, the winds against you so that you will have an intensity of desire, want, for Jesus. And Jesus loves to be 
where he's wanted. Ask Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They'll tell you all about that. And so I want you to notice then, then as the figure is passing them by, they say, wait a minute, that, that, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. And immediately they cried out, Jesus, Jesus. They said, it's I. Do not be afraid. I'm here. You really didn't want me before, so I let you be alone. I gave you space. Jesus was not a Messiah that was in your face. Oh, yeah, he stormed the temple and so forth, but he never forced himself or imposed himself upon anybody, and he won't do that in this revival either. you got to want him. But I'm so glad that the work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus, John chapter 16. And the work of the Holy Spirit, John 16 verse 8, is to convict us of sin and our sinfulness so that we can appreciate the good news of Jesus, a sermon on, uh, on the mount when he said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, the Beatitudes I should say, he said what? First utterance, blessed and happy, blessed and happy, are those who feel their spiritual bankruptcy. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is for those who feel bankrupt apart from him. Are you feeling in need of Jesus? What did Paul say in Romans chapter 7? Oh, wretched man that I am. You don't really appreciate the all-sufficiency the all worthiness of Jesus until you've come to the end of yourself. I'm so glad that the Lord will allow you to taste spiritual despair so you can appreciate when Jesus comes to the boat. And so I want you to notice here, this is powerful. I'm not done with this yet. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus knows just what we need to hear. You know one reason, one of the main reasons, and many reasons, but one of the main reasons I love Jesus, and one of the main reasons I believe in the personal, the love of my personal Savior, is because he always has something very personal to tell me every single day, and really, if I might be honest here, all through the day. You know, it tells us in the spirit of prophecy that Jesus is always sending messages to us for those who will listen. My sheep hear my voice. Do you hear his voice? If you hear his voice and you don't harden your heart, Hebrews 4 verse 7, John 10, 27 says his sheep hear his voice. If you listen and hear his voice, you will have a revival because his voice will tell you, you need me. And you need me more than you realize. Laodicea thinks that she's okay. She's good. Like Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Laodicea, very similar. Jesus told that very devout religious man, he said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Now that was a radical appeal for a man that felt pretty good, but he kind of wondered maybe he was missing a little something but it wasn't as punctuated as it needed to be. And Jesus said, you know what? If you're not born again, you're not going to be saved. And he told that how much more Jesus comes to Laodicea and says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and repent. Repent of what? Repent of your lack of fire. Repent of your lack of the first love. You've left your first love. And if you don't repent, do the first works, I'm going to remove the candlestick. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Would you agree? We need revival. And we need it desperately, earnestly. It is our greatest need. But you know what? The gospel means nothing unless we have a knowledge of ourself. That's why the work of the Holy Spirit is to give us a knowledge of ourself. Because sin deceives us. Sin is blinding. And so God will allow trials, fierce, blowing trials to smash against our circumstances, our life, so that we will cry out, I need you. I want you. Jesus shows up where he's needed and when he's needed the most. Can you say amen?
And so, how many believe it and receive this? All right? And so, the stormy night, the disciples were to learn that Jesus is always near when you need him the most. And so they would cling to him. Their faith was revived. Quickly, another story. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. I want to look at a few stories here. Matthew chapter 15. All right? Love to hear those pages turn. All righty. Matthew chapter 15. While you're turning to that, think about it. Jesus wants us to want him more than ever before. There's a key word that ought to characterize your spiritual life, your walk with Jesus. Desperation. And don't think that the desperation ever goes away. You can have desperation and yet you can also have peace. Now, how do you figure that one? Because it's only those who are desperate for Jesus that find peace. And so, think about it. He wants us to want him more than ever. He wants to accentuate that, intensify that. When I was five years old, my father's a pastor, and uh, when we were living in New Jersey, I was probably five years old, and, uh, or maybe we were living in Pennsylvania and we visited a Baptist pastor, <laughs> not trying to be down on Baptist pastors, but this guy was too much. He was a Baptist pastor, and uh, at the time I was one of three boys, I was the monkey in the middle, and, uh, and uh, as they were talking, we were outside by my parents' car, and we were talking, you know, at that age you don't really remember much, but I did remember this. I remember that this Baptist preacher became irritated and seemingly uh, really dry humor, and uh, apparently I was acting up. <laughs> How you figure? Anyway, I was acting up with some of my brothers, and so this Baptist preacher, without my parents' permission, opened up the trunk. That's right, maybe it was his trunk. All I know is a trunk opened, and he threw me in and threw my brother in and closed the lid, figuring this will take care of them. I must admit we were not arguing in that trunk. But I'll tell you what happened. I had an instant panic attack. There was only one consuming thought in my mind. What was it? I want out of here. I want out of here more than anything, and I'm banging. Uh, let me tell you something. Every second seemed like eternity. And I'm banging and banging and banging. And of course, when my parents and I reminisce, go down memory's lane, and like, they said, really, you know, we're so sorry. He just did it. It's like, okay, so guard your trunk when your kids are. So anyway, all I know is that this did something to my mind. It made me claustrophobic. Then, as if that wasn't enough, when I was about seven years old, once again, there was just the three of us. We were in Pennsylvania uh, near at uh, Blue Mountain Academy. There was a pastor's workers meeting and that was boring for kids. And so us kids ran up and down the dormitory hallway. And because this was a time, it was during the summer. And so it was just a bunch of empty rooms. And so we're running. We can hear ourselves echo throughout the quarters. And we're just having a blast. Who wants to sit in a boring workers' meeting? And so we're running up and down <coughs> the, the hallway. And uh, so we went to go to the restroom. And then we went to get out. The door was locked. Jammed shut. Locked. Man, we frantically, there was, I, from what I remember, one of my brothers was not in there. Two of us were. And we were banging. Let me tell you something. Maybe that's where I developed my preacher's voice. Man, I was bellowing out, help, help. I was desperate because more than anything, I wanted out. And I finally, seemed like an eternity, some precious man, I don't know if it's a pastor, I think it was a pastor, came and let out these troubled kids. Fast forward. Fast forward, I am now in Jerusalem. I am uh, on a tour. <clears throat> Actually, Mark Finley asked if I would take his place when he said at the last minute, I can't go, Mark, can you go? And so I was 22... Uh, 
I was about, uh, yeah, about 22 years of age, and uh, we, it was at night, and the tour group decided that they would just jam into the elevator, and I'm thinking to myself, whew, we are really crammed in here. And so the elevator door closed, and guess what happened? Hey, when this happens, it didn't go anywhere. And uh, matter of fact, no, I think it started out and stopped. And so those childhood memories uh, came to the forefront of my thinking. I'm like, you know, I wasn't yelling. Now I'm too, now I'm, I'm in the Lord's work and I'm thinking that's not too cruel to do, you know. But I felt like I'm going to go crazy in here. So I immediately started praying and sweating. Praying and sweating. Praying. I wanted to get out more than anything. Fast forward and finally... Uh, somebody came from the roof of the elevator and somehow came in. Anyway, we got out. Then, uh, I was probably about 38 years of age and I was having some health challenges and I was at uh, Wildwood uh, and they said, my doctor recommended you need to have an MRI and so I said, okay, and I went to a clinic nearby, and uh, I said, okay, uh, this is the MRI uh, machine here, and you just lay down, and you'll have a little a speaker that you can talk into if you need to, to come out, and I'm looking in that thing, and I'm thinking, whoa. Now, you got to understand, claustrophobic feelings and panic and so forth. This was just part of my personality now. And so I'm thinking, okay, and I'm like, Lord, why me? And so I said, okay. And so gradually that, you know, uh, that uh, just, uh, just uh, was moved slowly into this enclosed area. You know, it'd be one thing if it was just my head, but no, 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 the whole body goes in there. And I'm like looking. I'm looking. And I asked him, excuse me. Oh, and then I think it was like about five, ten minutes into it. Uh, I said, I just have a quick question. If I want to come out now to, to take a little break, uh, it, 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 what about that? It, it, well, you would have to start all over again. Oh, okay. I just want to know if I could come out a little bit. You see, claustrophobic feelings were so pronounced there was one thing I was thinking of. Oh, Jesus, I want out more than anything. Please help me. Fast forward, or I should say, not fast forward, around this time, I was working with Mark Findlay at Net96 behind the scenes in Orlando, and uh, Dr. Thrash was my doctor of Uchi Pines and once again going through some health challenges, and he said, you need to take some fever treatments. So I told Mark, you know, look, uh, can I have a little break here? I need to go up and get some fever treatments. He says, yeah, go ahead up. So I went through 32 fever treatments and lived to tell about it. You say, what are fever treatments? These are not spa treatments. This is 100, at times, 112 degree temperatures. Hey, when that happens, but at any rate, here I am plunged into there, and it's kind of like, Lord, I need to get closer to you. All right, we'll boil you. <laughs> And so I'm here in this, uh, submerged in this hot water, and my hydrotherapist, Mircea, uh, was Romanian, and, uh, and he, he and I prayed together, and he and I rehearsed scriptures together. He had little, little Bible promises, you know, from the little bread box there, uh, different colored uh, little cards of Bible promises, and we would rehearse them. Let me tell you something. Every fever treatment was a fierce trial for Mark Fox. But what got me by is prayer and Bible promises and Mircea's testimony. He said, Mark, I spent five years in jail all together, two different times, five years cumulative in jail in Romania during communism for keeping the Sabbath. I thought, how could I ever complain about this hot water? And let me tell you something. There was one thing I wanted. I want it out. But you know something? More than wanting out of the water, I wanted Jesus to be with me and to help me to endure what I knew I couldn't just jump out and receive the fever treatment. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you want more than anything. 
But Jesus wants to be wanted by you more than ever. Let's go to the story. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. We're picking this up at verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan. This was a non-Jew. This was an unclean Gentile, as they would label them at the time, from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. So her daughter, her beloved daughter, she loved her daughter, and her daughter was beyond just being, being uh, going through a troubled uh, phase. She was demon-possessed, harassed by demons. It was severe. It was extreme. And she only had one hope, and that is that this, this man, this Jew, Jesus, she believed he had the power. She believed he could do it. She believed he had the miracle working power. And so she came with this plea, I want you to heal my daughter. And she wanted that more than anything. Would you agree? When our children suffer, we want more than anything for them to be delivered, for them to be rescued, for them to be helped for them to experience a miracle. So this woman is like you, Mom, like you, Grandma. You can feel it. You can feel the pangs of her sorrow. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> in desperation, she comes to Jesus. This is not protocol. This is not politically correct. This woman comes. She's not thinking of her reputation. She really doesn't care what other people think. And she comes bucking the establishment, bucking the religious norms, and she's coming to Jesus in desperation with Jesus looks and sees her pleading eyes. Jesus hears her broken voice. Jesus feels her pain. But watch this. But he answered her not a word. That's an interesting response from a loving Savior. He ignored her. He acted as if he didn't even hear her. He seemed to turn a cold shoulder at her during her greatest moment of need. What's with this? Why? Would you agree everything Jesus did, everything he said, every facial expression was with a divine purpose of love? So there's got to be a rhyme and reason to this. There's something that should flash forth from this narrative that tells us some, gives us some insight into the character of God into the character of Jesus, into the heart of Jesus. And I want you to notice what's going on here. She loved her daughter, but Jesus is giving her silent treatment. He seemed to be indifferent. And then, so that, that's obstacle number one. Would you agree that's a big obstacle? How do you feel when somebody gives you the cold shoulder? Well, you just walk away. Mm-mm. Not if you're a distressed mother and you know somebody can help you. And so, obstacle number two. Obstacle number two. We're picking it up now at verse number 23. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away. Get rid of her. She's such a pest. They were irritated. They were annoyed. For she cries out after us, like, would you please stop her shrill voice and this... this, this it's just tell her to be quiet. Tell her to get lost. She's not a church member. She's not among the chosen people. And so she's an un unclean Gentile. She's a nobody. She's an outcast. She's a sinner. Tell her to leave. If you will tell her, she'll listen. But he answered and said, he's talking to her, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's telling her, sorry, you don't qualify. Application, decline, denied. What? Jesus is telling her, I'm not sent, except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But even then, the apparent denial, she read into it, love. And she knew 
that the, the, this moment, this moment was full of a miracle coming her way. Then she came and worshipped and saying, Lord, help me. Anyone else would have turned away. But Jesus knew that she wanted him to help her more than anything. And she had nothing to lose. She would not give up her prayer request. Oh, that we might have a faith in this revival of faith that will not be denied, and say, Lord, you got to help me. I want you more than ever, and I want you to move upon my heart. And so notice what's happening here. We've got to quickly move along. Notice he's saying, sorry, I can't help you. You don't qualify. Have to decline. And she is not turned away. You see, Jesus was testing her faith because he knew she could handle the test. God will never allow your faith. By the way, whenever we go through a, t a test, it's always about your faith and about your love. Those two things, the gold tried in the fire. I'm going to agree. In Jesus' life, his trials revolved around his faith and his love. If you have faith, you'll have love. If you have love, you'll have faith. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Galatians 5, 6. Now listen. Anytime your faith is tested, anytime your faith is tested, God knows you can handle it with his strength. He'll never allow you and I to be tested beyond what we're able to bear. And Jesus knew that this woman could handle four obstacles. Silent treatment. Uh, I'm not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Or, or rather, the, the disciples then saying, send her away. That's number two. Obstacle number three, uh, I'm just sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And notice here, notice here. Uh, I mean, you can check this out. Notice here for the fourth obstacle. Then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, here comes the fourth obstacle. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Give me a break. Anyone else would have just had their tail between their legs and off they go. Not this woman. This woman clung to Jesus. She had a clinging faith. She had a clinging faith. What kind of faith, everyone? A clinging faith. That's what, a, that's what desperation will do. Desperation's a good thing. If, if, if your lake is placid, you might not need Jesus to come and calm the storm. And so I want to notice here, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Couldn't have put it better. This woman had a spontaneous faith. She was not going to be denied, not going to be turned away. You see, sometimes Jesus plays hard to, be want, it, it play, it plays hard to, hard to get. I, I do that sometimes with my kids. You know, bet you can't catch me. Guess what? I let them catch me. Bet you can't tackle me. I let them tackle me. That's what Jesus does. See if you can search for me. See if you can find me. All right, you're going to have to search for me with all your heart. And it's not that Jesus is not easy to find. It's just that he wants to be wanted. Do you want him tonight? More than ever before? More than anything? Jesus said, if you love family more than me, you're not worthy of me. Now, I can relate to this a little bit. I love my family. I love my wife. 24 years. I love my wife. I love my children. I love them. But God says, love me more. Want me even more than you want the company of your family. Want me. Jesus wants to be wanted. And so I want you to notice here, and she said, yes, Lord, you know, give me the crumbs. Jesus gave her more than crumbs. Then Jesus answered and said to her, Oh, woman, not woman. Oh, woman. That's endearing. It's touching. It's personal. It's pathetic. Notice here, Oh, woman, great is your faith. In my Bible, exclamation mark. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, This is the kind of faith I want you to have. This woman had more faith than the disciples. 
This woman had more faith than most people Jesus was working with. And Jesus said, O oh, woman, great is your faith. So what would Jesus say about your faith? Oh, my child, great is your faith. Do you know that faith moves the heart of God? Do you know that faith moves Jesus? If you move the heart of God, you move the hand of God. But he first wants you to take hold of his heart. That's why the Bible is all about how you can trust the heart of God. Isn't that what the millennium is all about? Why a millennium? Why aren't the wicked just destroyed right away? Why a millennium? Because God wants you to know you can trust his heart. There's no, no reservation there. You can trust him fully and completely. And if you trust him, then comes the wave of joy and peace, the peace that passes understanding, the joy unspeakable, full of glory. Do you want that? Do you want this more than anything? I want you to notice here, we have to keep racing because uh, time is uh, waning. I want you to notice here in, in this story here. Let it be to you as you... <laughs> this is powerful. Come on now. Let it be to you as you desire. Can you give me another synonym for desire that goes along with what we're focusing on tonight? Want. You get what you want because I see how much you really wanted it. Do you know why the Lord delays many answers to our prayer? And many equate delay with denial. Not necessarily. Do you know why he delays many, many times answers to prayer? Is because he's asking us, do you really want what you're asking for? How much do you want it? Are you willing to keep pleading for it and keep preparing the way for it. By the way, delay is a time for preparation for receiving. That's why we can never say, oh, I'm just kind of waiting. No, 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 you're preparing. I don't know if you caught that. You see, our whole life, our whole life is about preparing. Preparing and, and receiving what God has for us. What things soever you desire, want. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Some things you get right away. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Some things you get right away. Forgiveness, the Holy Spirit, blessings, His presence, His power. You, you get these things right away. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes, how, sometimes the Lord will say, how much do you want me? How much do you want revival? Are you willing to cloister yourself in, in, in a church sanctuary, maybe for 10 days, praying for Pentecostal showers? Are you willing to fast? Are you willing to seek me with importunity? Are you willing to make some changes in your lifestyle? Are you willing to fast TV for a month? Oh, wow, that would be really, really heavy. Unless you want to watch 3ABN, then that's okay. But anyway, take your Bible and turn with me. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Maybe someone could give me the five-minute five, five minute signal. All right. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom, notice here, the kingdom of heaven is, I'm sorry, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers what? Violence. And the violent do what? Take it by force. What are they trying to take, Jesus? What are they trying to take, the promises of God? What are they trying to take? They're trying to take the Holy Spirit, trying to take the power of God. The Bible says that you must take what Jesus has promised and you must take it with a faith and with an intensity of desire that is likened to spiritual violence. You take the Word of God, you take Jesus by storm. You know the problem is many times our services are too lame, our faith too languid, our efforts too feeble, and we leave the same way we came. No, 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 let me rephrase that. 
Let me restate that. We leave worse than the way we came. You know why? Because either you get closer to Jesus or you get further. There's no neutral ground. No neutral ground. And so the Bible makes it very clear. Jesus wants us to have spiritual violence. To want him with intensity. To have an intensity of desire. Can you say amen? Amen. Another story real quick. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. It's the Sunday afternoon. Rumor had it that the body of Jesus was missing. There were so many reports circulating from that eventful, dramatic, tragic weekend. Cleopas... And the other disciple, there were two disciples, were walking on Emmaus Road. You might have seen the beautiful painting of the two disciples, this, this uh, duet, this, uh, the, the, these, these two disciples that loved Jesus, but now they were dejected and depressed, and they were engrossed in their conversation, their dreary recital of, of, the, of the tragic disappointment of their master, their Messiah, dying on a cruel cross. Their hopes were dashed against the rocks. Now they wondered, what does the future hold? Everything seemed bleak, dark, forbidding. And as they were walking along, and the sun was starting to set, it was late afternoon, a stranger, a lone stranger, became their traveling companion for a while. And he said, the stranger asked them a probing question. uh, Why are you so sad? Why are your faces so sad? What's the problem? Why do we pray? Is it to inform God something he doesn't know? It's to give him our heart. I love steps to Christ. Ellen White says, prayer is the opening of the heart. To God is to a friend. Psalm 62. Oh, read the book of Psalms if you want your heart to open up to his heart. Read the book of Psalms. David was a man after his own heart. How many want to have a heart for God? Read the book of Psalms. Read the book of Psalms. It's a good prayer manual. Pray the Psalms. And it says in Psalm 62, verse 8, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And so he said, tell me, what's the problem? And so he said, what? You you don't know what's been going on? Are you a stranger around here? You don't know what just happened this weekend? We believe that Jesus, this this man from Nazareth, we believe we were so excited. We were so euphoric. We thought this certainly must be the Messiah. But he was crucified. And now we don't know where his body is. is missing. And he says, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that was written in the scriptures about the Messiah. Well, what did we miss? And Jesus began to give give them an unforgettable Bible study. You see, the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. And so Jesus gave them a Bible study. And you know what? Don't miss the point. Jesus gave them the right Bible study at the right time. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. That's why we receive our morning manna, and it's called meat in due season, our daily bread. And Jesus gave them a Bible study. And one doubt after another that was circulating in their mind disappeared, vanished, evaporated. That's the power of the Word of God. His Word does not come back to him void. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Hallelujah. There's power in the Word of God. Power. His words are spirit and they are life. You've heard the expression, get a life. How about getting the Word of God? That is your life. The Bible says, John 6, 63, it is spirit and it is life. That's why we're told to preach the Word because the Word is living. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Now, Now watch this. Watch this. Don't miss this point. After he gave them a Bible study, their hearts were once again aflame. 
And now they wanted more than ever to believe in this Messiah. And then they were at their home. And this stranger acted as though he would keep on going a different route, a, take a different turn. He was going to keep on going. And immediately, <laughs> let's pick this up. This is powerful. I got to close. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I want you to notice here verse 28. I love it. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he, he indicated or acted as if he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, stay with us, come to our home, have a meal with us, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. And in the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White says that if they did not compel him and urge him to stay, they would not have known who it was that gave him that moving Bible study. This is your time. Jesus is here. And he has revival power. If you want him, He's closer to you than you realize. If you don't want him, he's further from you than you realize. I'm here tonight to tell you that Jesus is acting right now as if he's going to pass right on by, as it were. How many want to say, Lord, I want you more than anything. Don't pass me by. You come and abide with me. You stay in my heart. Lord, I want to sit down. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, open your home, and ask him to come in, I will come in and what? What's the last part of that? And sup with them. In other words, Jesus is saying, let's have sweet fellowship. If you want me, I'm there for you. If you want Jesus more than ever, would you kneel with me? And let's ask Jesus to not pass us by. Oh, loving Father in heaven, we are cradled now in your presence. And we need you and want you and desire you and your loving presence more than ever. We are nothing without you. But I thank you, Jesus, that you're right here. We embrace you. We love you. And we want you to make yourself at home. In Jesus' name.